So this, if it were true, and it is true, would put the Sphinx back to a much earlier period, which would tie in with Schwaller's work and John Anthony West's subsequent work, that there were indications that dynastic Egypt as we know it, going back to about 3000 BC, was really a legacy of what I call now an earlier cycle of civilization. Robert M. Schock, a geologist with a PhD from Yale University, came up with a fascinating idea in the 1990s about the age of the Great Sphinx of Giza. He noticed something interesting about the erosion patterns on the Sphinx and the surrounding area. Unlike the typical wind and sand erosion you'd expect in Egypt's deserts, these patterns looked more like they were caused by water. This was a big deal because it suggested that the Sphinx might be much older than we thought. Now, Graham Hancock, a well-known British author who loves digging into ancient mysteries, found Shock's theory really interesting and started supporting it. Since the early 1990s, question marks have been raised over the age of the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. Egyptologists think it's about 4,500 years old, although there's not a shred of inscription evidence to support this date. Independent researcher John Anthony West and Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University, have made a case that the Sphinx must be much older than that. Hancock is known for questioning the usual stories we hear about historical and archaeological sites. Shock's theory caught his eye because it suggested that the Sphinx was around during a time when Egypt had a lot of rain, which was way back around 8,000 to 10,000 BCE. This idea of heavy rainfall leading to the erosion we see on the Sphinx today is really cool, but also quite controversial. You see, traditionally, archaeologists have dated the Sphinx to around 2500 BCE, during Pharaoh Khafre's time. They base this on where the Sphinx is located in the Giza Pyramid complex and how it looks compared to other stuff from that period. But if Shock is right and the Sphinx was actually built when it was much wetter in Egypt, then it could be thousands of years older than we thought, maybe even dating back to the Neolithic era. That's a pretty big shake-up in how we think about ancient Egyptian history. To put it bluntly, the Sphinx did not originate with Khafre in the uh, Fourth Dynasty and really the beginning of my serious work and career looking at ancient civilizations. Instead of the typical wear and tear you'd expect from wind and sand in a desert, the Sphinx had features like deep cracks, wavy lines on its limestone walls, and smooth rounded edges. These are the kinds of things you usually see with water erosion, not wind or sand. Now the Sphinx is made out of limestone which is pretty easy for water to wear down. And what's interesting is that this limestone is made up of different layers, some harder than others. Shock saw that the water erosion affected these layers in a way that you wouldn't really see if it was just wind and sand doing the damage. But here's where it gets even more intriguing. Shock looked at the climate history of the Sahara Desert and the Giza area and found out that way back between 10,000 and 5,000 BCE, this place wasn't the dry desert we know today. It was actually pretty wet, thanks to something called the Neolithic subpluvial phase. We know there were ultra hyper arid Sahara conditions on the Giza Plateau for the last 5,000 or so years. And this ties in with the origins of civilization according to the standard story, which is that civilization began between 4,000, 3,000 BCE. This was a time when there was a lot more rain. So Shock thinks that this rainy period might have caused the kind of water erosion we see on the Sphinx, suggesting it's much older than we thought, maybe even dating back to these wetter times. This goes against the usual dating of the Sphinx to around 2500 BCE during Pharaoh Khafre's reign, based on its style and where it's located in the Giza pyramid complex. Shock's idea definitely shakes things up in terms of how we think about the Sphinx's age, so Robert Schock didn't just look at the Sphinx in isolation when he was thinking about this whole water erosion idea. He actually compared the wear and tear on the Sphinx with other ancient limestone sites that had been exposed to a lot of rain. This was his way of checking if what he saw on the Sphinx matched up with known patterns of water erosion elsewhere. It's like looking at different worn out jeans to figure out if they got ripped from climbing trees or just from washing them a lot. He found sites with a clear historical background where they knew for sure that rain had done its thing over the years. When he looked at these places, he noticed that the erosion patterns were quite similar to what he was seeing on the Sphinx. 
This kind of bolstered his argument that the erosion on the Sphinx could really be from water, not just wind or sand. You look at the evidence, and that's really where I was coming from. But my point is that even in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when I first got involved with this, if I looked at it critically, the evidence was not that definitive for the age of the Sphinx. Shock's approach was pretty comprehensive. He wasn't just a geologist looking at rocks. He was also considering the weather patterns from thousands of years ago and what archaeologists were saying about these ancient sites. It's like he was piecing together a big jigsaw puzzle from different fields of study. But of course, there are always different sides to a story. Some critics pointed out that the erosion could be due to other natural processes unique to the Giza area, like fluctuations in groundwater, or the way certain chemicals in the air might wear down the rock. And then there's the whole thing about what archaeologists have found around the Sphinx, like artifacts and writings that suggest it was built around 2500 BCE, during Pharaoh Khafre's time. This kind of goes against Shock's idea that the Sphinx is way older because of the water erosion. So it's a bit of a puzzle with some pieces still missing. Graham Hancock has this really intriguing idea about an ancient civilization that he thinks existed way before the ones we usually learn about in history books, like the Egyptians, Sumerians and the Indus Valley folks. He reckons this civilization was around many, many millennia earlier, and that it might have been wiped out by a huge comet impact around 10,000 BCE. Imagine that a whole advanced society just gone in the blink of an eye, leaving only bits and pieces behind, and here's where it gets even more interesting. Hancock thinks this civilization wasn't just hanging out in one spot, it was all over the place, having a global influence. He suggests that after whatever disaster hit them, the survivors might have traveled far and wide, sharing their knowledge and helping kickstart other ancient cultures. Hancock dives into myths and oral traditions from all over the world too. He's not just dismissing these stories as old wives' tales, but considering them as potential historical records. For example, he's really interested in the flood myths that pop up in different cultures. He thinks these might be a collective memory of a real event that had a huge impact on this lost civilization. The best explanation is that floods of icy meltwater released by the heat and kinetic energy of the impacts flowed off the North American ice cap and into the Atlantic Ocean, where they interrupted the Gulf Stream, a key element of the central heating system of our planet, hence the sudden and dramatic cooling. Now Hancock is big on astronomy. He points to how some ancient structures like the Giza pyramids and the Sphinx line up with certain stars and constellations. He thinks this isn't just a coincidence but a sign of advanced astronomical knowledge. He's also into the idea that these ancient folks understood the precession of the equinoxes. That's a fancy term for a slow shift in Earth's rotation over a 26,000 year cycle. If he's right, it means they were way ahead of their time in understanding the cosmos. Graham Hancock has this captivating theory about ancient civilizations and their architectural wonders. He's really into how these old structures like the pyramids in Egypt, Stonehenge, and those incredible megalithic sites in South America show off some serious engineering and architectural skills. Hancock reckons that to build these things with such precision and detail, those ancient folks must have had some advanced knowledge and technology that we don't usually give them credit for. Take, for instance, the way the stones are cut at Pumapunku in Bolivia. Hancock points out that the cuts are so precise, it's as if they had access to some really advanced tools. And when it comes to building massive structures, he's all about the techniques they must have used. He's amazed at how accurately these huge stones were fitted together, often without any mortar, and wonders how on earth they moved and positioned stones that weigh several tons. This isn't just your everyday heavy lifting. We're talking about some serious know-how in engineering and possibly some clever uses of leverage and pulley systems. Now he doesn't stop there. He's also fascinated by the mathematical and geometrical knowledge that these structures reveal. He talks about the use of the golden ratio, pi, and precise angular measurements, which shows a sophisticated understanding of math and geometry. Like, take the Great Pyramid of Khufu. Its alignment, the way its base is perfectly level, and the precise angles of its sides, Hancock sees this as evidence of a much more advanced understanding of geometry and engineering than we might think. Then there are the monumental buildings in Mesoamerica, such as the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan and the Mayan Pyramids. Hancock highlights their architectural sophistication, urban planning, and the use of large stone blocks. 
All of this, to him, points to a level of technological proficiency and knowledge that goes way beyond what we've traditionally thought was possible for these ancient cultures. In a nutshell, Hancock is looking at these ancient structures and saying, hey, there's more to the story here. He's suggesting that these civilizations had a depth of knowledge and skill in construction, engineering and mathematics that challenges our conventional understanding of ancient history. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. And if we then consider the possibility that the Olmecs may just be the latest, the, the, the earliest surviving manifestation of that calendar, it could go back. Then there's Teotihuacan in Mexico. Hancock looks at the layout of this ancient city and sees a kind of mirror image of our solar system's planetary orbits. To him, this suggests that the people who built Teotihuacan had a pretty detailed knowledge of astronomy and space. Stonehenge in England is another example. Hancock thinks it was used as an astronomical observatory because of how it aligns with the solstices. He sees this as further evidence that ancient people understood celestial movements really well. And let's not forget about the Pyramid of Kukulkan at Chichen Itza. During the equinoxes, this pyramid casts a shadow that looks like a serpent. Hancock sees this as a sophisticated way of tracking the sun's path, again showing an advanced understanding of astronomy. Hancock also dives into the idea of precession, which is this slow wobble in Earth's rotation that takes about 26,000 years to go full circle. He looks at how the Giza pyramids align with Orion's belt, and how the Sphinx lines up with the Leo constellation during what's known as the Age of Leo, around 10,500 BCE. He thinks these alignments aren't random but deliberate, showing that the people back then understood this complex astronomical phenomenon. So, in a nutshell, Hancock is really into the idea that ancient structures around the world weren't just built for the heck of it. He believes they were deliberately aligned with stars, constellations and celestial events, showing that ancient civilizations had a much deeper understanding of astronomy than we usually give them credit for. This is one of the things that you know, the archaeologists and the prehistorians, people are looking at that, have failed to take into account. Now, within there, there could be all kinds of stuff that's not even recognized as being artificial in the sense that humans had anything to do with it. Tucked away in the heart of the Great Pyramid of Giza lies the King's Chamber, a marvel of ancient Egyptian architecture that continues to fascinate historians and visitors alike. If you look at the famous King's Chamber, its walls and its ceiling of the King's Chamber are all made with gigantic uh, granite blocks. Imagine walking through the Grand Gallery, a corridor stretching 47 meters long and rising 8.6 meters high to reach this iconic chamber. This journey alone, through such an expansive space within the solid stone of the pyramid, showcases the incredible skill of ancient Egyptian builders. Now, Egyptologists will tell you that, oh, they could move heavy blocks because they put them on wet sand and they push them along on wet sand. Well, maybe if you're just at ground level, that will do. But when you're 350 feet above the ground, as you are in the King's Chamber, that won't do at all. The King's Chamber itself is a testament to the Egyptians' advanced understanding of materials and construction techniques. Carved from red granite brought all the way from Aswan, over 800 kilometers away, the chamber's very walls speak of a civilization capable of monumental feats of logistics and engineering. The room's dimensions, about 10.47 meters by 5.234 meters and 5.974 meters high, are thought to be imbued with symbolic meaning, perhaps aligning with celestial or pharaonic principles. If we're only looking for a mere reflection of ourselves, we could overlook it completely. I think we're getting very close to rediscovering some of the things that our ancient ancestors were up to. At the chamber center lies a red granite sarcophagus, believed to be the intended resting place of Pharaoh Khufu, though intriguingly, no human remains have ever been discovered within it. The sarcophagus bears marks of damage and wear, silent witnesses to the millennia that have passed since its creation. Its very presence in the chamber, given its size, suggests it was placed there during the construction of the room, hinting at the meticulous planning that went into the pyramid's design. Above the chamber, an ingenious system of five relieving chambers helps distribute the weight of the pyramid, protecting the space below. This feature highlights the ancient builder's sophisticated understanding of structural integrity. Additionally, the chamber is equipped with two narrow shafts extending to the pyramid's exterior, 
Initially thought to be for ventilation, these shafts are now believed to possibly serve a more symbolic purpose, possibly aligning with stars or celestial phenomena significant to Khufu's journey in the afterlife. Step into the heart of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and you'll find yourself in the Grand Gallery, an awe-inspiring testament to the ancient Egyptians' architectural genius. I don't know how they did it. All I know is they did it. I don't think anybody knows how they did it, how they lifted those stones, how they brought them up to that level. I think we're looking, again, at a lost technology. This corridor is not just a path to the king's chamber. It's a showcase of ancient ingenuity and a symbol of the civilization's advanced engineering capabilities. Imagine walking through this grand space with walls that narrow as you look upwards, thanks to the sophisticated corbelling technique used in its construction. This method, where each layer of stone slightly overhangs the one below, creates a dramatic narrowing effect towards the ceiling. It's a clear sign of the Egyptians' mastery in using architecture not only for structural stability, but also to inspire awe. The materials themselves, limestone blocks for the walls and heavier stones for the ceiling, were chosen with care, ensuring the gallery could bear the immense weight of the pyramid above. The Grand Gallery served a crucial role as the gateway to the King's Chamber, possibly designed to awe and inspire those who walked its length. But its purpose might have extended beyond mere access. Some scholars suggest it played a part in the pharaoh's funeral procession or other rituals connected to the afterlife journey. Features like the Great Step, a massive stone at the gallery's end, and various slots and holes along its walls hint at a space designed for more than simple passage, possibly aiding in the construction of the chamber. Moving on to another fascinating marvel of the pyramid, the Queen's Chamber. It holds mysteries that have puzzled scholars and enthusiasts for centuries. Despite its regal name, it's widely believed that this chamber was never intended as a final resting place for a queen. The lack of any burial artifacts and its distinctive features have sparked endless speculation about its true purpose. Positioned centrally within the pyramid, yet at a lower elevation compared to the majestic King's Chamber, the Queen's Chamber offers its own unique allure. Imagine venturing about 20 meters above the ground level through a corridor extending from the Grand Gallery to discover this intriguing space. Its dimensions create an unexpectedly spacious environment, with a pointed roof reaching up towards the pyramid's core, adding to the chamber's grandeur. One of the chamber's most striking features is a large niche in the eastern wall. Standing about 4.6 meters high, this vertical recess has baffled many. Was it intended for a statue serving a symbolic or ritualistic purpose, or does it hold a deeper meaning related to the pharaoh's journey in the afterlife? The construction technique of the chamber's roof, using corbelled layers of stone that create an inverted V-shape, mirrors the design seen in the king's chamber, suggesting a deliberate architectural choice to ensure stability and perhaps to bear symbolic weight. Theories about the chamber's purpose are as varied as they are fascinating, some suggest it was used for rituals related to the pharaoh's rebirth or regeneration, with the niche possibly housing a statue or symbolic object. Others propose that its location and design might reflect ancient Egyptian cosmological beliefs or serve a more mundane purpose, like distributing the pyramid's weight or housing a statue of the deceased in a Sir Dab-like arrangement. Recent technological advances have opened new doors in understanding the Queen's Chamber, Non-invasive techniques like infrared thermography and muon radiography have been employed to peek behind the chamber's walls, searching for unknown cavities or clues to its construction and purpose. Within the Great Pyramids lays another mystery. Its air shafts and the subterranean chamber features as fascinating as they are puzzling. The air shafts, narrow corridors carved into the stone, stretch from the king's and queen's chambers to the pyramid's exterior. These aren't your average architectural elements. Their design, discovery, and speculated purposes are a treasure trove of intrigue and speculation. First off, these air shafts are tiny, just about 20 by 20 centimeters, too narrow for any human to pass through. They zigzag with precision towards the heavens, pointing to specific regions in the sky that held great significance in ancient Egyptian cosmology. Discovered in 1872 by the engineer Wayman Dixon, the shafts from the Queen's Chamber were a late find in the pyramid's history, adding layers to the mystery surrounding this ancient wonder. Originally thought to ventilate the chambers, this idea doesn't hold up for the Queen's Chamber shafts which don't quite reach the exterior. Instead, the prevailing theories are far more mystical. 
Some believe these shafts were aligned with stars or constellations like Orion and Sirius, linking the pharaoh with the gods of the afterlife. The intrigue doesn't end there. With modern tech, robotic cameras probe these shafts, uncovering doors and chambers within, deepening the mystery. What were these ancient engineers up to? The plot thickens with the subterranean chamber, a rough-hewn space carved into the bedrock. Unlike the finished elegance of the pyramid's upper chambers, this one's all raw edges and mystery, suggesting it was abandoned mid-construction. Was it intended as Khufu's original tomb, a symbolic underworld, or something more practical like a flood defense? Theories abound, but no one's quite cracked the code. This chamber's unfinished nature has led to all sorts of speculation about its purpose and why it was left incomplete. Imagine stumbling upon a hidden chamber within one of the world's oldest and most mysterious monuments. That's exactly what happened when scientists discovered the Big Void, a revelation that's as thrilling as it is mystifying. The key to uncovering the Big Void was muon radiography, a fancy term for a technique that uses naturally occurring particles called muons, which rain down from the Earth's atmosphere. These particles have the unique ability to penetrate solid stone, providing a way to peek inside the pyramid without drilling or causing damage. By detecting variations in muon density, scientists can identify empty spaces like our newly found void. This discovery was the result of international teamwork, part of the Scan Pyramids project, which brought together experts from around the globe to explore the pyramid's innermost secrets. So, what do we know about the big void? Well, it's situated above the Grand Gallery, a known cavity within the pyramid, and stretches for at least 30 meters, roughly the length of the gallery below. Its size suggests it was a significant part of the pyramid's design, but its purpose remains a tantalizing mystery. Was it intended to relieve weight from the Grand Gallery below, a hidden chamber for ceremonies, or perhaps just an architectural quirk? The truth is, we're not quite sure yet. The discovery of the Big Void opens up new avenues for exploration and research. Scientists are now considering more advanced methods to study the void in detail, like drilling small holes to insert cameras, all without harming the pyramid's structure. This void could provide invaluable insights into how the ancient Egyptians built such monumental structures and why they included such spaces within the pyramid's design. Each new discovery within the Great Pyramid is a piece of the puzzle in understanding one of humanity's most remarkable achievements. The Big Void isn't just an empty space, it's a reminder of the mysteries still waiting to be solved and the stories of the past yet to be told.